for me, unexpected, um, all of it was unexpected. All this is unexpected. Um, the library card, for instance, was unexpected. Because um, I didn't make the image for the library card. This painting and image was already made. And they selected it. Um, so it, it's been a surprise and hugely unexpected. Um, uh, it's a lim limited edition, 100,000 um, and of these library cards, and 50,000 have already been given away. So, and in a very short period of time, I think it's only been three, three months. months. Yeah. Since April, so yeah, that's yeah, that's three months. So yeah, pretty impressive, They've, I would say. <laughs> people better go get theirs. That's right. <laughs> if they want to hold on to that, is there a dream project that you still have? I mean, because you've done so much, so many very vivid, vivid paintings, so colorful and just so many different messages. But is there a dream project that you would really like to? A dream project. Um, you know. Um, I wouldn't be able to think of any dreams, but something like a dream that had taken place was the workshop and the demonstration that I did mm -hmm. at Stevenson Library. Um, that was almost like a dream, uh, is, is uh, coming in full circle, because um, it was the library that I, that I frequ frequented with my brothers and um, you know, uh, and to go back like almost forty years later, and to sort of enrich the community, or to um, not necessarily teach, but to show the kids from the neighborhood, from the community, uh, what is possible, uh, and uh, there are many things out there in the creative field that uh, they can they can pursue. It's like you're empowering them basically, right? You I hope so. No, I, I definitely think so you are. I mean, you're encouraging them and showing them a different route. I have to ask you, you know, as artists, our brains are always thinking and there's different things coming to mind. Of course. Um, but we can also get stumped. <laughs> yes. and, right? Because you're like, okay, I've done this. Now what do I do next? Yeah. Because you know, what keeps you inspired so that you want to continue to create and when you do your last painting or the most recent one you're not like oh this is it i'm done but no i have this fire in my heart that still burns to make more well i think i've been able to um garner a few fans and you know i think uh i, I I'm inspired by um, bringing to them the next excitement, you know, um, and to violate their expectations. Well, we <laughs> look forward to having you violate more of our expectations. It has been such a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for oh, coming thank you, in. Oh, Asha. This has been so much fun just learning about oh. your work. Um, your inspiration Thanks and how you're empowering people. Me. So thank, thank you, you again. Thank you. Uh, and thank all of you for joining us. You are watching LA Currents. Don't hurt me this way. Don't touch me this way. When a physical encounter occurs between man and machine, the machine always wins. Please, don't lose. Obey all the rules of the road. Don't let me make the same mistake again. this week. I'm Anna Marcos here at the Museum of Illusions in Hollywood where you can catch a few thrills and we are upside down!
I'm Rasha Goel. Up next, how you can experience the diverse storytelling behind Guatemalan masks here in Los Angeles. Just how much effort does it take to put on a show at the Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery? I'm Gil Reyes with a behind the scenes look. Hi everyone, I'm Umema Rashid. Here's what's happening on LA This Week. It was the biggest party of the year in South LA as the Central Avenue Jazz Festival celebrated the musical history and culture of South Los Angeles, the West Coast birthplace of jazz music. Put on some ribs, I stand a beer. We're here at the 24th Annual Central Avenue Jazz Festival. It's an opportunity for us to celebrate the history and legacy of Central Avenue. Listen, put on some ribs, baby, some blue. The music is great, the food is great, but most importantly, the people are great, and I'm going to have a good time. And I'm going to have a good time. And let's give a great round of our applause to current price. The price is right. God bless you all. Have one hell of a day. It's very clear, darling. Our love is here to stay. Not for a year, but ever and a day. The telephone, movies that we know. Many would say this is where uh, West Coast jazz really originated. The musicians that played here uh, were legendary. What's behind this event is to pay homage to what Central Avenue was about. There was a time in Los Angeles you could literally walk down the street and you could bump into Ella Fitzgerald. You could bump into Count Basie or you could bump into Ho Billy Holiday. Dragonfly out in the sun. You know what I mean, don't you know? Butterflies are having fun. Los Angeles is the capital of forgetting. And so this festival, the intent of this festival, is to continue to celebrate what Central Avenue was about. And I'm feeling good. Interest in Central Avenue has been renewed uh, for housing, for job creation, business development, and we want to encourage more of that. I think it's a great opportunity for networking, for vendors, and I'm happy with the results. I will be back next year for sure. your first time at this event? Yes, it is. About 22 years I've been coming here. All the old guys like Burley Collette and all of those guys, Joe Wilson, they all done died. But you got a lot of young musicians that's coming up and they sound pretty good. You guys having a good time? The king began to sing. He said, move up, Shabam, move up, leave up, boy. Part of the band. All the head cats in the land heard it on the father's band. Crazy ripping is a thing, makes you want to dance and sing. I've a doo be, I've a doo ba, boy, that's crazy ripping. Don't make sense, got no rhyme, it'll knock you out in time. I've a doo be, I've a doo ba, boy. You should have jazz every Sunday. Events like this give all cultures an opportunity to learn about different cultures. You see through the miracles of modern miracle science, man has figured out a way to extend the period of good time. So I wrote this song about a little blue pill. Looking for love. 
nothing is better than us coming together. And music is like the international language. Summertime is a great time to be outdoors and play sports like tennis. One group of lucky kids at the St. Andrews Recreation Center in South Los Angeles not only received special tennis lessons from professional coaches recently, they also learned about the importance of inclusiveness. Saida Pagan has more. Imagine what it's like to play tennis in a wheelchair. These kids from the St. Andrews Recreation Center summer camp got this once in a lifetime experience. Minutes earlier, they had had the chance to see an amazing demonstration from two wheelchair-bound tennis champs, Anthony Lara and Henry Reyes. I appreciate them because I know what they're going through, not being able to get up and run around like everybody else. Now today I'm able to give back and share some of the smiles and share my experience, but mostly share the game I love. The wheelchair demonstration and the group tennis lessons are all the result of a partnership that the U.S. Tennis Association has with the Los Angeles Department of Recreation and Parks. The goal is to increase the number of tennis programs across the city. Now that these kids have seen how challenging it can be to play tennis in a wheelchair, they say they realize that life has no limits. Eight-year-old Blair Ball says she's ready for more tennis. I really liked how to play tennis and with a lot of help and having a partner. And on the wheelchairs, it wasn't that very hard. It was just like moving the wheel and like hitting the ball. It's all about education, awareness, trying it, and see that they can do it. When I see some of these kids hit that tennis ball while they are sitting in a wheelchair, it's amazing. The LA Recreation and Parks Department plans to develop and expand an adaptive sports program. So in the future, expect to see more opportunities for all children to compete in sports. For more information on the Department of Recreation and Parks events and activities, log on to laparks.org. Every year, the Grammy Museum hosts a summer camp. This year, students were treated to a performance by a popular folk band. Anita Bennett has the details. This could be so easy if you could see it through my eyes. For music-loving high school students, this is a once-in-a-lifetime moment an afternoon with Seattle folk band, The Head and the Heart, as part of the Grammy Museum's Grammy Camp. The band belted out several songs and answered questions on breaking into the business. Yeah, like a month after we all lost our jobs, we signed a record deal, and that's been our full-time gig since, that was nine years ago. They stopped for pictures and chatted up the importance of music. Music allows for you to kind of go across the lines, go outside of the lines and express, you know, your angst, your, you know, all of the emotions, the good, the bad, you know, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it, if you can channel that in a productive, you know, beautiful form, that's really affirming for youth. This is the 15th year the Grammy Museum has held an interactive summer camp. The goal of Grammy Camp is to take these students who have a passion for multiple areas of music on the business side, on the technical side, and on the performance side, and give them a sense of what the music industry is like and get them thinking about developing a plan to help them reach that goal. The five-day camp is hosted by USC and held in the school's music complex. Now, when they're not listening to live performances, the students spend their days in classes learning about things like songwriting and audio engineering. Let's go take a look. That's why I keep the room mic right here so I can... Great job. Sorry about that. Information the students hope to use well into the future. I hope to send it out, like use it all in the real world and be able to work with artists and bands and work on an efficient level. But for now, he can just sit back and enjoy the music. Grammy Camp is open to students from across the country. For details on how to apply for next year's camp, head on over to GrammyInTheSchools.com. Parks in the San Fernando Valley just got a lot more beautiful thanks to more than 400 Boy Scouts who came out to clean them. Welcome to North Hollywood Park. I am so thrilled 
to see so many scouts and scouters here to be able to to make a difference in this community. We're here today to help beautify and clean up North Hollywood Park. Boy Scouts of America approached us. Uh, they're a great organization. They wanted to do a cleanup here at this park and other neighboring parks, so we say, why not? Great opportunity. We're gonna um, paint the graffiti and we're gonna mulch the trees and we're gonna rake. Many hands make light work. This is an example of that. Stop littering. You have to pick up your trash, care about the environment. He is learning to save the environment and he's being responsible not just to clean it but keep it clean. Over 400 scouts have volunteered. Part of the reason that we're here today is to kind of restore a little bit of that goodwill to um, help uplift our parks and our communities. This project that you're doing is going to be seen by the entire North Hollywood community. We see all of these young people here who could be doing any number of things on a beautiful Saturday morning, but instead of doing those things for themselves, they're coming here to be helpful to others. A program that helps create relationships between police officers and kids is launched in the Mission area. City officials reinstate a ban on sleeping in a car overnight. And Twitter launches a tool that can connect you to the world. All this in City Beat. City Councilwoman Nuri Martinez and the LAPD recently launched the Mission Area Police Activities League program in North Hills. The Crime Prevention Program will work to create a positive influence on the youth in the area by relying on recreational and educational activities to create a trust between law enforcement and the kids. From July 25th to August 4th, Twitter users have the chance to have video interactions with each other in a global conversation. Hashtag TweetUp, powered by Shared Studios, will have 40 fully immersive spaces to create a worldwide meeting place. What we're trying to do is encourage people to embrace difference across distance. And we want people to meet people who they wouldn't have otherwise met. The LA City Council voted to once again ban sleeping or living in vehicles within 500 feet of schools or parking on residential streets between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. The ban has started immediately and is scheduled for six months. As if Hollywood isn't already full of fun places, well, here's one more. The Museum of Illusions will titillate all your senses and will leave you hanging upside down. Or will it? Adam Marcos takes us on a wild tour. Here at the Museum of Illusions, you will get plenty of thrills, including this upside down house where you can do all kinds of crazy All the childhood fantasies or nightmares you ever had are about to come true at Hollywood's Museum of Illusions. Illusions! Illusions are awesome. Can you walk on the ceiling? You bet. And is this guy doing yoga on top of the fridge or holding up the fridge? Jurassic dinosaur bones for your dog? You got it. Or how about a little time on the red carpet hobnobbing with the stars. He's amazing. <laughs> it kind of just emits like 3D and just like your perspective of it. It's kind of cool just messing around, taking pictures. It kind of expands our little imagination of like our children, you know, how we used to be like when we were five, six years old. It's like we're kind of playing it out and so it's pretty cool. Pretend like you just saw a shark right there. What would you do? Ready? One, two, three, go! Oh yeah, you even get concierge level help posing for your pics if you want from the very imaginative staff. Ah, I'm gonna scream! One, two, three. Woo! Cupcake joys, having to escape skyscrapers on fire. 
fantasies, colorful, pretty, bad, scary, and ugly, are all at your disposal. I'm like, yo, let's smile, let's have fun, be extra, because this is the place where you can do that. Yeah, I just wanted to have fun, you know, get the best action that I could. For some people, though, all of Hollywood, both inside and outside the museum, is one big fantasy funhouse. Like if an artist were to like just print out his imagination, I feel like Hollywood is a definition. Like I really love Hollywood. It's a piece of art. Michelangelo, move over. For more information, visit LAIllusions.com. They say to never judge a book by its cover, but have you ever wondered about masks? Their creation, history, and the story they're telling? Rasha Goel has more on an exhibit that brings us the stories of Central America. 80 masks depicting the narratives and history of the indigenous and non-indigenous populations of Guatemala are now on display at Fowler Museum at UCLA. It's the Guatemalan Masks Exhibit. The masks embody key characters from historically and culturally significant dance dramas. Many of the masks that you see in here are, uh, represent key characters out of traditional masquerade performances. And some of them are about the history of the conquest, of the Spanish conquest of indigenous Guatemala. Some of them are staging the narratives of the histories of Catholic saints. Some of them are about animal pageants that sort of demonstrate moral values. I am so fascinated by all these masks. The masks are handcrafted and carved, and some of the oldest ones date back to the late 18th century. You see masks that represent living combatants, and you also see masks that represent folks that have fallen in battle. The masks were usually worn by local residents or people from semi-professional folk troops that were paid to perform. Coming to this exhibition, you're sure to learn something new. In many ways reminiscent of um, Indonesian masks, which is quite extra. I never had that conception before I walked in here today. Seeing these things take back us to history, like when there was nothing, like we didn't have all this technology and modern world. These days now, where we have all these source of entertainment, we have everything, but we are still bored and lonely in life. There's so much more to see here. To get the ultimate experience, you need to come down to Guatemalan Masks. The exhibit runs through October 6th, and it's free. In addition to the exhibit, there are also activities for adults and children, such as kite building and sculpting. You can find more information at fowler.ucla.edu forward slash events. Okay, here's a question you don't hear every day. Do animal intestines gross you out? Well, it's food for so many cultures, perhaps even yours. As Gil Reyes reports, that's the theme of a new exhibit at LA's longest running art institution. Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery puts on an average of nine exhibits of contemporary art every year. Today we go behind the scenes for a glimpse at all the effort it takes just to put on one show. And it happens to be their biggest art show of the year. A year's worth of planning has gone into the upcoming awful exhibit at the Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery. The pressure's not only on the applicants that are tr hoping their works will get selected into this show. Um, we also then have um, all of these artworks to manage and artists to communicate with. Curators say it is crunch time. More than 40 selected artists now work with museum staff to put everything up by opening day. The exhibit's name, Awful, refers to the eating of animal innards or intestines, how different cultures do it, and how we Americans respond. There's that idea of other people eating those innards, like we don't eat those things. Um, but one of the most common kind of American foods uh, is made of awful, which are the, hot, the common hot dogs. Oftentimes Americans, are that they themselves are in denial that they eat a lot of that stuff too. Artist Janine Shinoda will have several works on display. In order to get the work here, a van had to come and pick up the work because it was too fragile to be in a car. For my work, um, this is the first time it's actually been installed in a gallery, so I came here to ensure that it was done properly. My artwork is two-sided, and so it means 
It means that it needs to be hung um, in a way that uh, people can get around to both sides and see both sides. So that was a consideration that had to be taken in. And there's strategy behind that. You yeah. just don't hang whatever on yeah. the wall. You it's have to have visually that. appealing, also stimulating for your mind. It's food for thought. Check out Awful at the Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery at Barnsdall Art Park. Opening reception is on Sunday, August 11th. The exhibit runs through late September. Established in 1954, the Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery is LA's longest running institution dedicated to art. It's located next to the famed Holly Hot House. As always at the gallery, the exhibit is free. For more info about the museum, visit lamag.org. There are a group of female filmmakers who are creating their own unique space for women in the film industry. We meet these LA-based trailblazers in part one of a two-part report. I assume you're reading for the role of cashier? Yeah, how, how'd you know? Well, you're obviously not reading for a hot female customer. Touche. I went through hundreds and hundreds of festivals, and I just wanted to find something very specific. Woman, funny, Latina. I kind of went through, looked at the reviews, just look, went to the website and looked at other things that had been submitted, and then um, I was like, wow, I think I might have a shot at this, and so I entered. Many, many, many years ago, I was an actress in um, Like Mother, Like Death, which won the Audience Choice Award. You know, and so then when I was beginning to do my own things, it came across my radar, and I was like, I remember this festival. I just loved the, the log line. It says, women write, women direct, everyone laughs. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. When we went there, I have never been in a room full of female filmmakers. Like, we, we are the majority. And I left so energized. I was like, oh my gosh! Yeah. All these Same. women creators, like I had never seen that before. So I was just so excited to yeah. be with other women creators that were like not a Shonda Rhimes, but that were actually yeah. like we were all on the same level yeah. and we could yeah. compare notes. And it was, I yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, and you're at your house, like you do feel insecure and you're like, oh, I'll never get anywhere. And oh, everybody's ahead of me. But I have to say, I, I follow Amy on Instagram mm -hmm. and she's like posting almost every day about her web series. And to me, that's extremely inspiring because, like, I want to give up every day. But then I see her, like, she, you're what, drawing the third season? Yes. That's, that's <laughs> incredibly inspiring. Yeah. You know, really, that's our secret power, our secret weapon is supporting each other and lifting each other up so that eventually we're going to populate the film industry yeah. with broads. There's plenty of room at the table, I think, for everybody. Absolutely. And and the idea is that yeah, like we lift each other up and and we support each other. And I, I don't think I don't as much as it's a, a film festival competition and things like that. Really, like just being here and being together is what the prize is. Yeah. To get to see that quality of work yeah. and then be like, I was included in this quality of work. Like, yeah. oh, that makes me feel special. And I also it was inspiring to watch other people's things. I really admire um, the Broad Humor Fest for allowing us to share our voice with a community. So many places we don't get to tell that story, right? Because there's all these ideas about women in filmmaking, right? Like women aren't funny, you know, or, or you know, women aren't good directors or not good leaders or, or whatever it is, right? And then there's this festival that like is just blowing the doors off of all of that, all of those notions that are just not true, they're false. I think you achieved all of the goals that you probably set forth for the festival in terms of empowering women, inspiring women, showcasing women. It's not just a festival for women. It is in, in that we are the ones, the filmmakers, but um, you know, everybody was there, men and women, were really enjoying the films mm -hmm. and the screenplays, you know, everybody was laughing together. Uh, because if, if nobody's seen it, if you don't see it, if you don't see a representation of that, you don't ever know that it is, exists and you don't know that it's out there. And this festival really highlights that and is wonderful at it. What I was pleasantly surprised about the first time that I submitted for the festival, it, it's run by these brilliant women of color mm -hmm. and like, we know what it's like to, to feel left out of the conversation and to not have a platform. So when you give a woman a platform, she's gonna make sure that more people are represented and more communities are represented. And, and that's what, what I love about the festival. And that's why I hope I come back again. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, we go behind the scenes with the women as they put together the festival. If you love tea, like me, here's your chance to try a variety of different flavors. Shimmy a shake at a dance party, 
and get up and close and personal with Japanese culture. All this and things to do. Come one, come all to the 11th annual Los Angeles Tanabata Festival. This Japanese festival is celebrated along streets and inside shopping malls decorated with large, colorful streamers suspended by cables and rope. Wish upon a streamer at the 11th annual Tanabata Festival, happening August 10th and 11th from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. For details, visit tanabatalosangeles.org. Tea lovers and inquisitive newcomers alike are invited to experience the Los Angeles Tea Festival 2019. Come sip on top quality tea and engage in in-depth discussions and presentations on teas from every region. Try unique tea pairings, craft tea-infused cocktails, and boba while enjoying colorful performances and activities. The LA Tea Festival is fun for the whole family August 10th and 11th. The event takes place at the Magic Box at the Reef from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. For more info, visit their listing on Eventbrite. Get ready to shimmy and shake at the Rock This Plaza Rockabilly Dance Party. Enjoy live performances by two of LA's top rockabilly bands, Official Gamblers Mark and Moonlight Trio. The night also includes pre-1960s hot rod cars, East Side vendors selling vintage items and more. It's all happening at the Rock This Plaza Rockabilly Dance Party. The party kicks off at La Plaza du Cultura y Artes on August 10th beginning at 7 p.m. For more information, check out their listing on Eventbrite. Red Cat's annual New Original Works Festival returns for 2019. This summer laboratory features contemporary dance, theater, music and multimedia performances. This year's festival debuts nine new works by LA emerging and mid-career artists. Explore hybrid artistic disciplines at the 16th annual New Original Works Festival, happening now through August 10th at the Red Cat Theater in downtown LA. For more details, visit redcat.org slash festival slash now 19. Join the herd at a fun-filled weekend in celebration of World Elephant Day. The LA Zoo invites you to learn amazing facts about these magnificent animals and to explore various ways that the zoo and others are working to safeguard elephants in the wild. The World Elephant Day celebration happens all weekend, August 10th and 11th. The celebration will take place at the LA Zoo and Botanical Gardens. For more information, visit lazoo.org. And that's a look at some things to do. That's it for this edition. I'm Umema. From all of us here at LA This Week, thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. See you next time for more LA This Week.
Good morning, good morning. Today is Tuesday, August 6th. I want to welcome, welcome you all to City Hall. This council meets every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. And the public is welcome. Madam Clerk, we do have a quorum. Would you please call the roll? Plumenfield, Bonin, Buscaino, Cedillo, Harristassen, Weiser, Coretz, Krikorian, Martinez, O'Farrell, Price, Rodriguez, Rue, Smith, Wesson. Twelve members present and a quorum, Mr. President. First order of business. Approval of the minutes. Smith moves, O'Farrell seconds. Next. Commendatory resolutions for approval. Bonin moves, Cedillo seconds. That brings us where? Mr. President, today is Tuesday and time for the flag salute. If we could all rise, Mr. Smith, would you lead us, please? Ladies and gentlemen, you please join with me in our pledge allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, let's continue running through the agenda. Mr. President, there is a request to continue item 12 to December 4th and items 27 and 28 for one week to Tuesday, August 13th. Okay, so ordered. Continue. Items 1 through 22 are items noticed for public hearing. Do you have cards? There are cards on item 1, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 14, 15, 16, 18, 19, 20, and 21. Okay, so let's, let's uh, hold those items and then we'll move on to the next. And for clarification, there are cards now on all items 1 through 22. Okay. Items 23 and 24 are items for which public hearings have been held. Okay, let's prepare to vote on these items. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 12 ayes. Continue. Items 25 through 40 are items for which public hearings have not been held. Ten votes are required for consideration. Okay. Uh, so without objection, those items are now before this body. Do you have cards? Yes, there are cards on all items. All right. Continue. And Mr. President, that then takes council back to presentations, items called special or general public comment. Okay. Okay, let's uh, get a couple of our public comment, uh, multi-comment out of the way. If I could get Ms. McAllister, you have items 32, 33, 35 in general public comment. Good morning, Mr. President and everyone. Okay, well, we have a lot of items on the agenda today, and I'd like to start with... Um, Talk about, I'm on 33, 34 couple there. Now, here's the deal. I still have a problem with you guys accepting money from the developers. Now, we did have the ethics committee in here last month, I think, and they talked about they're writing up some, some laws here, some ethic laws where you cannot do that. That is a conflict of interest. If you give me a $50 million contract, a construction contract, and I kick back $10 million to you, that's a conflict. That, in Chicago, where I'm from, that's called taking money under the table. But you guys are legalizing taking money under the table. You're putting it on the agenda and calling it a donation. You don't take donations from developers. That means that that developer will continue, most likely, to get contracts from the city. Other people, other developers, they have the right to compete. And they shouldn't have to pay to get a contract. You're saying you want this developer to kick back 65000 Here's another one. You want them to kick back 500000 now, where is that money going? In some fund, and it'll end up in you guys' pockets. So you can't, I'm from Chicago. We, we created the scam, okay? Now, um, I, I'm just, you know, I just don't like that because it, it eliminates honest developers who want to get city contracts also. And uh, here on number 32, you want to waive 
the city of Los Angeles multifamily bond policy to the law of the California statewide communities development authority to issue bonds not to exceed 60 million to finance acquisition, rehabilitation, improvement, and, equipped, and equipping 142 unit senior affordable rental housing. Now here's the deal, you're not building anything. You said you're gonna fix it up, you're gonna, record, you're gonna buy it, rehabilitate it. Rehabilitate means it's there. So why do you need 60 million? The building is there, you're just fixing it up. You've got all these names on here. We're gonna rehab it, improve it, equip it, but we need 60 million. It doesn't take 60 million to fix up a building. So I don't know who in the um, budget department is approving this, but I know and I, know, I want the voters to know that everything this council votes on, when they vote yes, the mayor has to sign it. And that's why we have a petition to uh, recall the mayor. He's signing off on this nonsense that you guys are voting yes on. You don't need 60 million to fix up a building. And most you probably need, I say, I give you half. I give you 30 million. That's really too much. So um, I see you guys playing with our money. I wouldn't get upset if it wasn't my tax dollars too, but it's my money too. Because every time we look up, you give it, you, you're charging us more fees, okay? More fees here, fees there, fees there, because you, you're gonna get yours. The way I see it, you don't care if this city collapses, you're gonna get your money under the table. And I think that's, that's not fair. May I have my minutes, Mr. Give her President? Her one minute. Yes, ma'am. I have talked to Lassa, and I've gotten information from Lassa, and Lassa has said that uh, I wanted to know from Lassa how much money has they received from the city from 2015 to 2019. They received 194 million. Now this comes from Lassa, 194 million, and there are 200, 290 so, so shelters, shelters. That's what you're investing the money in. And then Lassa told me that they haven't placed anyone in HHH housing because you haven't built any HHH housing. So that's how it works. When you build the HHH housing, the homeless are supposed to go to Lassa. So those ones who are living in Lassa, they get referred to the HHH housing. Lassa told me nobody has been referred because you haven't built anything. Now I asked them how many uh, Mexicans, well not Mexicans, but Hispanics and Latinos have been um, placed, none of them, of course, but we do have quite a few of them living in um, this transitional housing. That concerns me because transitional housing means that they've been placed out of a shelter and given housing. We need to give that to Americans. Thank you. Thank, God for Thank you. Okay, Mr. Previn, you have items one, A, B, C, to F and then six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 14, 15, to 21, 29, 30, 31, then you have 35, 38, and I think you have 36 as well. Please come forward. Thank you, sir. It's Eric Previn, and uh, I believe 36 is the salute to recreational. I'll, I'll save that for a moment. I, I love recreation. The, the lean's not that crazy about, I know you got a whole roster today, and I want to thank uh, Rodriguez for having a robust 5,700 against her uh, constituent. And one of, the, one of the poorest districts, it's impressive. And uh, congratulations to Rue for getting some street sweeping doing over in Ventura Boulevard. Uh, you know, he's been very diligent about that area. Um, he loves them. He loves them over there in Sherman Oaks, and he's going to make it very, very clear. Today, sir, the reason why there's so many items on the agenda, I believe, is because it's... Uh, it's Tuesday, Vacation Tuesday, or something like that, because we have several vacations of property. Now, vacations of property is when the city makes a plan to offload city property to a constituent. We heard about Wellington Yang last week, the neighbor who got a giant, you know, Carol's working on that, but. And we heard about, obviously, uh, Weezar, which set a whole series of concerns in motion when it was quite clear that people were being kind of having their arms twisted in order to get the vacation from the great gubernador like yourself. One is from CD10 today. And so by clustering them all together and saying you can speak on it, it's just kind of like let's get the exposure over on one special day. That's why you've also got four alcohol necessity 
uh, programs, which is always a good one. I like to see the way you mix it up. A couple of them are bars where you'd have late night reveling, and a couple are where you just go pick up some booze and bring it out onto the street like a CVS and a Smart and Final. So you're, you're mixing it up and keeping the, the liquor flowing in town, which I think has um, everybody. By the way, ACOM, A-E-C-O-M, who you gave the <clears throat> $17 million feasibility gap contribution for TOT, which caught everybody off guard since they ran Mayor Garcetti's uh, inauguration, had an amazing quarter. They just had record-breaking numbers. And this is during a time when the market is collapsing, as you know, because of the trade war. So I just wanted to bring um, that to your attention. Now, as we head into uh, the naming section, sir, nobody has named more Korean squares than you have, sir, except for possibly David Rue's going to catch you eventually. But it's so charming the way that happens because it definitely gives a flavor for the neighborhood that you love them. And then they're willing to contribute if they want to anybody, uh, including Holly Mitchell or Jam Perry or you, sir. It's, it's, that's the thing. There's choice, as Bonin likes to say. You have choice that way. So you can either do it to the guy who named your street Korea Square or uh, go ahead and give it to Holly Mitchell. She's got some nice issues. That, in fact, today's uh, Women's Suffrage Day over at the county, so we can talk about that. But, sir, you're good at what you do, and I think people know that, and that's why um, we're so pleased. The one thing that I would say about what the previous speaker said about donations from developers, I think that does blanch the mustache. And I know that Mr. Rue has been a leader in trying to say, let's make that illegal, but that's because he knows that you can't make it illegal. I think the way to block developers from giving donations to council members is for council members to hold hands over here at the podium and say, we're not going to take them. And that diffuses the whole thing. You have the First Amendment right to say, no, I don't want it. Just like they have the First Amendment right to ply you. Thank you. Give him his one. His one minute. I save item 36, salute to recreation, because my kids played soccer. Yours probably did. I know you were a coach, sir, was I. We, we had a great experience on a wonderful open field in Studio City. Now, uh, if you talked to me three weeks ago, I would have looked sleepy and on vacation along with Sheila. But now I'm up, up against the wall because I feel like our Studio City Rec Center Park is experiencing an unwanted application for funds to do something obscene on the open space. 69% turf reduction, Bonin. Let's check that. Horrible. And then across the way at the Weddington Golf and Tennis, which has real cultural historical value, never mind Ken Bernstein and the folks up in your division, real cultural historical value is being co-opted by our dear friends at Harvard-Westlake, who we're going to speak with, and we're hoping they're going to retain some of the recreational uh, publicly accessible recreation space. Because right now it seems as if open space in Studio City is under siege. And we, you know, we know what's going on. The neighbors were initially, the Harvard Westlake took them out and gave them meatballs to calm them down, which works well, actually. But once the meatball is gone and digested, they realize, wait a minute, this is a ripoff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Previn. Let's get Mr. Herman. Mr. Herman, you have items 1A through... 1M, then you have two. Through 22, then you have 25A to 25G, and then 26, 29, 31, 32, 33, 34, all the way to 40 B and C. Go ahead, Mr. Herman. No, no, um, you have to wait for your name to be called, Mr. Herman. I bring my records for the record, honorable nigger. Reasonable accommodation, my nigger. Because you know, well, nigger, I too participate on lean. Why, Harris Dawson nigger leave because he don't want me to talk about the $2,459.56 lean. Nigger, where you got? Where'd he go? CD8 off of 1638 West 56th Street. A lien for $1,284.56. Well, I'm, 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 I'm now back on my, 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 my mental health medication like you, Herbie, so let me get on topic. You know, in, in the history of the city of Los Angeles, you know, people get liens because they have a, a system called Threat Management Unit where they want you to pay these excessive fines and penalties because your trash is in your front yard. So if you have a tire, you have a lumber, if you have too many cars in the front yard, put the shit in the garage. That's what they tell you to do, but they give you this. Building inspector. Yes, sir. 
Oh, you need to clean your trash. Well, that's my priceless gold, sir. When I decided to retire and be old, I plan to give it to Salvation Army with, with the return from the Catholic Church niggers. Well, sorry, sir, Bob. We have to find you. Well, that's not fair. I, all I want to do is pay the lien. But you're giving me a 300% interest charge in addition to that. You're retaliating against me because you keep sending this, the city attorney and inspector to my house to question about my belongings. But, sir, right here off of 7740 North Sepulveda Boulevard. Mommy! Decided to put a lien for $522.42. Well, that's priceless. Mommy can waive that as of today. Because in CD6, oh, nice acoustics, huh? Oh. Let, me, let me stay on top of it. So, that's that bullshit. Let me go to the other fucking shit on this fucking stupid long agenda full of crap. No one gives a fuck. Uh, th these are the public records. Yeah. Two fucking kids in here. What do you want me to stay fucking do about topic. it? I'm talking about Radio Korea Square. We're going to build in Koreatown. We're going to build in every fucking small city in the city of Los Angeles because a nigger like me wants housing. And no matter where you are in Wilshire Boulevard, those Jew niggers are going to open up the floodgates to allow more Radio Korea Square, or no, Korea Square, whatever the fuck that means. I don't want to talk about yeah, this shit. Yeah, let's give him his one minute for general. So, ladies and gentlemen, public matters. We're going to have a discussion today on item three regarding Price Waterhouse Copper's litigation regarding a matter which involves a fraudulent misrepresentation case against you. You, the people who have been billed and overly billed by this racketeering, corrupted fucking city of Los Angeles against Price Waterhouse and Copper's litigation. Now, mind you, some of you think some of my outbursts are robust, but let me remind you, the city of Los Angeles has a, a undercover police department called the Threat Management Unit, called the TMU. And those niggers like to slap you when you get up here and say something offensive. So under 42 USC 1983, Fuck you! Thank you, Mr. Herman. Thank you. Okay, now let us, uh, that closes our multi comment, but I still have individual comment that we'll get to. So, uh, Madam Clerk, if we could vote on items 2 through 11 at this time, items 2 through 11, please open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 14 eyes. Now let's vote on items 13 through 19, plus 21 and 22. Please open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. Thank you. If we can vote on items 25 and 26, open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 14 eyes. Now let's vote on items 30 through 40. Please open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. And if we could quickly move to item 29, Madam Clerk. 14 eyes. If we could move to item 29. I have one card on that, Mr. Aguilar. Art, please come forward. Yes, sir, welcome. Good morning, Mr. President and council members. My name is Arturo Aguilar, president of the Amalgamated Trans Union Local 1277, which represents the maintenance workers here at MTA. I'm also the chairman of the California Conference Board, which represents 13 locals in this great state, 14,000 public and private bus operators. Congresswoman Napolitano introduced the bill 1139, which helps to protect our operators and your constituents. Every day our operators go to work not knowing what will happen. They may have urine thrown at them, beaten, stabbed, raped, and yes, even being murdered. 
This bill will make the bus manufacturers to come up with the bus construction to, op to for, I'm sorry, to protect our operators. Think about this. You enter this building and all the safety and precautions are in place to protect you and everyone who is attending the meetings, even walking through City Hall. A taxi cab driver has a partition to protect them, and when we fly, the pilots have a security Thank door to protect them as well. Thank you. Uh, I can only give you a minute like everybody else. We appreciate you coming down. Uh, that concludes comment on this item. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you would please open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 14 ayes. That's approved, sir. Mr. Cedillo, are you ready with your presentation? Yes, sir. Please come up. Come up. Everybody here, who's here with you, come up. Can we get her? Yeah. See, 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 don't us, don't us. Everybody here too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike. Yeah, come. Everybody join us. Everybody join us. Join us. See, see, see. Can we get the uh, Ramon Rubacaba and James Johnson? You can join us. James Johnson. Mr. President, uh, this is obviously, you can see by the group of people who have gathered, a very special presentation about a very special uh, phenomenon, a culinary and social phenomenon that exists in my district in Highland Park. As you know, I uh, love to tell you stories about my wife, and it was about 1982 that, um, we, were, we had a group of friends who had moved into Highland Park and uh, we're always trying to compete who knew the best breakfast places, the best restaurants. You know, we were from Boro Heights, so the Tepeyac was obviously our claim to fame. Uh, and uh, Jorge Gonzalez, skinny guy at the time, told me, you know what, uh, you gotta come up to La Beja. And then there was another guy, who, uh, Marco, who was a chef who said, oh, you gotta come to La Beja, it's a family restaurant. So my wife and I went over there. It's a very modest, if I may say that, very modest, humble, <laughs> very humble place. But it is uh, remarkable as a social gathering. You see council member Mike Hernandez is here. Uh, this is where he holds his office hours these days. Uh, <clears throat> his uh, Mike Hernandez uh, consulting, uh, ironically has the same address as uh, La Beja. And you'll see many other political leaders, social leaders, uh, artists, uh, community leaders. It, it is the gathering place, and all of us have these gathering places in our community, and this is the one. Now, I have to tell you, when we first went, you know, we were, it was interesting because it was um, your mom, right? My mom. Gloria and your aunt? Gloria. Both oh, Gloria. Gloria. Yeah. Both Gloria. Yeah. Yeah, and so this is a third generation, four generations have worked there. So it's very interesting because when we would first go, uh, it wasn't a place you could like suggest what you wanted to eat, but the, uh, uh, the mother would tell you what you were gonna eat. So it was very interesting. <laughs> so my wife being very slender, she would you know try to fatten her up with these great potatoes that were just like my mom's. The papas were just 
like my mom's, and so um, she would make sure that my wife got more to eat. And I, of course, got less. Um, and we would take my son, and it's just interesting because I'm looking at you, and it's like there's just generations of people that you uh, know. 50 years is, is a significant amount of time. And, uh, you know, I've been going, as I said, from the very, very uh, early 80s and watched the family I grew up and everybody works there, the whole family. And sometimes some of the customers will work there and sometimes some of the friends will work there. It gets, gets really crowded. People will just help out with serving coffee and water and, and things like that. Um, the food is great, uh, but the atmosphere is, is actually why we go. Uh, but the food is really special. Uh, I have my favorites. <laughs> Chorizo, huevos rancheros. Uh, the burritos. Uh, they're featured at my Latin Jazz Music Festival. There's an interesting story because they, the family bought this restaurant in the mid-70s as a bakery. I didn't know that. But as a bakery, and uh, there was um, some work going on in the area, part uh, industrial, part um, uh, residential. And so the workers would come by to buy the bread, but they would smell the food. And so they always wanted to buy the food. And they, the family was cooking for themselves, but the people would smell the food and wanted to, to uh, buy the food. So the, the word got out that there was this great food there as they would you know, get into getting some of the, the food that was sold. So eventually, they just made some adjustments and turned uh, the bakery into a, um, into a restaurant. And so it's... Uh, you know, a very, very special place. Of course, Jonathan Gold, who used to follow me around, uh, went and was, did a review for the LA Times. They've been featured in La Pignon, uh, KCET, uh, NBC Los Angeles. Uh, you've got to go there. Like I said, it's a very, very special place, uh, particularly for people who want to uh, meet other people. It's one of those places, literally, as, a, as an elected official, if you want to find out what's going on in the community, you simply just have to go in there. And then they've got some other great things. They've got the Three Stooges. Yeah, you got Three Stooges. Uh, <laughs> everywhere. And then they've got this incredible candy, um, what do you call it? Display. So if you miss some of your favorite candies that you grew up with, the Red Hots, or the Lemon Heads, or the Boston Baked Beans, uh, my favorites. Uh, <laughs> They're all there. Those uh, Jolly Rogers are there and uh, a whole range of others. So uh, I just wanted to share that story with you. I want to share uh, them with you. This is special. They're on their 50th anniversary. And so it, you know, it is a significant date. And I just cannot, I, I lack for the, for the words to, to talk about how great this place is. I will tell you, in my most recent election, Mr. President, there was a uh, forum, a debate that we were at, and so there was a test to see what, uh, what were your five uh, favorite locations in the district. And so, of course, I chose the restaurants. Um, of course, my opponent had no clue. And um, I laid out five restaurants throughout the district, and of course, La Beja was uh, right at the top. And so. With that, uh, let me introduce uh, Rogelio and Paula. You want to say something? You know what, Mr. Cedillo? Before, if yes. I could recognize Miss Rodriguez. Yes. Oh, you're 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 from the Northeast. You, Thank you know well, what we're talking I'm a about. Valley girl, but like I say, yeah, I'm yeah, a Valley yeah. girl with East Side roots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, and, no. You know uh, the Northeast. La Abeja is in the neighborhood that my dad grew up in in Cypress Park. Right on. He grew up on Arroyo yep. Seco. Um, but as, uh, you know, as uh, Gil mentioned, uh, Mike Hernandez always would hold office hours and meetings there. And so there were a number of home-cooked meals that I had there that I got to enjoy at La Abeja over the years. Um, but more importantly, I think one of the things that, and, and Gil mentioned it, uh, all the accolades that you've received from some significant folks in the culinary world. It was recognized for uh, the kind of meal, the kind of authenticity and heart that was served there. 
And I just want to congratulate you again, you know, from very humble beginnings. I think what's really special about the story of La Abeja and what you guys created in the Northeast LA area is that it was home to a number of families and uh, elected officials and community members uh, with a lot of heart. And it was reflected in the food, it was reflected in the ambiance, everything there was a family-oriented environment. Um, and it's, it's just a beautiful legacy, and I just wanted to congratulate you on creating such a powerful and long-standing legacy in the Northeast, uh, but more importantly, uh, on your well-earned retirement. I know it's, uh, it's probably a bittersweet and hard time to, uh, to transition, but um, what a beautiful legacy to have been a part of, and I'm grateful again, uh, and you know, on behalf of my family that I know uh, grew up going to La Abeja over the years, and um, just congratulations, and thank you for all of your years of service in the community. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, back to you, Mr. Just give me a round of applause. Back to you, Mr. Cedillo. Mr. President, let me introduce uh, Council Member Mike Hernandez. As you can tell, I've been eating at La Veja for all 50 years. Uh, and, and, and it's a fact that my mom had an account there, and, and she would tell us, go pick up some burritos at La Veja, and she'd go pay them at the end of the week. And, and it's that kind of a place. I just want you to understand that the folks that are here, you see at that restaurant all the time. Uh, the people who aren't here who've been to that restaurant are people like Tom Bradley mm -hmm. and, and Stanley Scheibaum. Um, Richard Altori is there all the time when Angie lets him go eat there. Uh, the, the realities are uh, Roy talked to me one day because I was having these 8.30 meetings at La Veja and he opened at 8. And I'd have with Tom Bradley or Stanley Scheinbaum. And I didn't know this, but LAPD would show up and clean out the restaurant <laughs> because uh, Stanley Scheinbaum was under a threat or something was going on. So Roy said, you got to stop having these meetings here. And I didn't understand what he was talking about until he told me that. And I stopped inviting those kinds of guests. But what ended up happening is La Veja is a place you can go and take someone to eat without a conflict with MTA because their meals are less than $10. <laughs> uh, we always said La Veja is a place you go to have a meeting when you don't want anybody to know you're having a meeting. And uh, it's that kind of place. And again, I want to thank everybody who showed up to thank the Fonsecas uh, because they are a community institution. Uh, they did it the hard way, waking up every morning and opening up that restaurant. Mm -hmm. And the only day they're closed is Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. And those of us in the political world know how important Tuesdays are. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but again, thank you yep. Gil, for recognizing them. I did not do this. Ed Reyes did not do this. Uh, Gil Cedillo did this. Thank you. 50 years. Thank you. So this is a community uh, uh, expression, and so Paula was the one who brought this idea to us, although it was always on our mind. But please say a few words, Paula. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I've uh, been a resident of Northeast Los Angeles for about 16 years now. Uh, very proudly, I love my city, and this is home. These people are family to everybody in Northeast LA, so this is a beautiful recognition for them. And um, it is a little bittersweet because I know that they need a break. Um, and so we'll all have to uh, make do with that. But um, they're wonderful people. I'm so grateful to Councilman Cedillo for um, doing this and, and immediately said, yes, let's do it. And uh, this is a great honor for them. So we'll give them all the limelight today. I'm sure they have something they want to say. Uh, the proprietor, it's hard to think of him that, like that, but. Uh, <laughs> Officially the proprietor, but he's my brother. Uh, there's so many people who have gone there. We forgot to mention Mayor Villaraigosa as well, and Fabian Nunez, and Kevin De Leon, and the whole crew. Uh, so many elected officials who live over on this side of town uh, know that that's the place to be on Saturday mornings. Uh, but with that, Rogelio, please. Thank you. It's your stage. Okay. Just First. give them a real round of applause. Welcome to City Hall. Thank you for your service. First of all, I'd like to thank 
the whole council, thank you for this recognition. It means a lot to me and my mom and dad. They're the ones that started this place. I just follow them behind their, uh, their thoughts and their mind on how to do something special for community. They, they really love too. I just try to embrace everybody that's come in. It's not a customer. After so many years, they become family, mm -hmm. all of you. And uh, for me, it's hard to really put it to my heart. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to thank everybody that showed up here, and I thank you for giving me this recognition. It means a lot. I will honor it and cherish it for the rest of my life, and I know people will be thinking about us <coughs> for the rest of our life. Hopefully, we can brought a little joy into your heart. But uh, again, uh, I, I'm sorry I'm doing this, but... Uh, it's overwhelming. You don't get something like this special every day. And uh, hopefully when I do pass away one of the days, people think about La Beja and what we did for the community and for their souls. Just to feed them a little beans, a little rice, you know, and um, chit-chat. <laughs> but uh, that's one thing I would love to do, talk to people so much. And I used to be very shy as a kid. But overall, I still like to thank you, and I'd like to thank all my friends, family, a lot of you people that came over to the restaurant over the years. and. Uh, I'll, I'll, never, I'll never forget this, honestly, as long as I live. I, again, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And my wife wants to say a word. I appreciate it. Thank you, kind again. Thank you. Hello. I'd just like to thank each and every one of you. Like I've always said, thank you for supporting us. All of my customers, they're not my customers. They're my familia. They're my family. And I've always told them, mi casa es su casa. And thank you for all these years of my wonderful customers that are here. Uh, it's just, it means too, too much. But thank you all, and God bless you. So on behalf of a grateful and well-fed community, <laughs> we want to acknowledge Abeja for 50 years of incredible service and for being an anchor and a root in our community. Thank you, God bless you. Say something, Mil? You want to say something? Go ahead, go ahead, come on. Also, it's been an honor to work out La Beja for these years. <laughs> Michael, come on. <laughs> Tell him you're the fourth generation. Say, I'm the fourth generation. Also, I'm the first of uh, fourth generation of La Beja. Because that. it's first my cousins, which is Jake and Vinny, those are the two of them, then it's my brother and I. So it equals me as the fourth generation. Oh of my God. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Monica Fonseca Volmer, and I do have to say, because my parents have been the world to us, I remember Mr. Cedillo and all the other councilmen prior. I was 10 years young when I started busing tables there. And I remember I used to serve him and Ruby Huevos Rancheros. I knew what they and how they liked it. And Mike Hernandez had his own specials. But the main thing I do remember were my grandparents who helped or organize everything and they were the backbone. My dad was the one also always supporting. And to see my father get this sentimental over this means a lot to him. And it means a lot to us because as for my sister, brother, and I, we've been there. All these people behind us, they're our family. They also have four generations that have been going to our restaurant. Yes. So it is an honor and thank you for this recognition because if I see my daddy happy, then I'm happy and I will be happy as well. So thank you very much. Wonderful. I'm 
the eldest daughter, Viana Fonseca Valiente, and just, of course, thank you for this awesome, great honor for my dad. He doesn't cry. He's, he does a, he's a man that does not shed a tear. But today, just really got to his heart, and obviously I know it means the world to him. So I really want to thank everyone for doing this, especially you, yeah. Gil. And just also busting the tables on the weekends, even when I got my license as a nurse. Yes. I was a nurse Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday, waitress, cashier, whatever you call it, I was there. Um, but that's one thing my grandparents, my parents instilled in us, hard work. Um, treat others the way you want to be treated and just to give to your community. Yeah. And I want to thank them for instilling that in me and in my family. Thank you. Let's give them another big round of applause. Great, great presentation, Mr. Sadia. And Erica, was it item 35 you wanted us to send forth with? Yes, there is a request. By Mr. Harris Dawson. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. President, additionally, there are requests to continue two items, one M and one to L, to September 4th. Without objection. Let's uh, take up item 20. Do we have a Tari? Tari, I. Tari, last name begins with a K. Please come forward. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Good morning, my name is Tari Kubangua. I'm a representative from FE Design and Consulting here for the PCN application at 7605 and a half Beverly. Um, it's for an existing retail space and the restaurant operators of the Tironi restaurant next door would like to take over that existing space. Um, it was the cocktail lab. It has an existing CUP that was supported by stakeholders in the community. And as you'll see, um, Council District 5 also supported granting PCN for um, the Tironi restaurant operators who take over that retail space and keep it as a separate business. So switching out like for like. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spindler, item 20. Mr. Spindler, I'm going to start your time. Come on, walk up to the mic. Thank you, Honorable Nega, for giving opportunity to open liquor store to drink very good. Lots of Jew drink lots of liquor, get drunk, hit other Jew, run over other Jew. Very good. Alcohol good to get rid of white cocksucker Jew. It's good. We as Chinese people support every effort to go for you filthy fuck American to drink. Yes, now what happened with liquor? Chinese people make liquor, ship stay on, to nigga, stay on, stay nigga on the didn't give to Jew, and Jew didn't approve wicker white stuff for nigga, and nigga get run over by Jew. Right. Thank you, honorable nigga. Thank you, thank, thank you, Mr. Spindler. All right, let's prepare to vote on this item. Let's open the roll. Close the roll, tabulate the vote. 15 ayes. Want to take uh, item one at this time? Mr. Spindler, you're on item one as well. And thank you again, honorable nigga, for letting me talk to this, for lean. Now, we see very a problem. Now, we go to 1K. Big, fat, fucking cunt, nurry on 1K. For 774 or no subhavita. You, you evil woman, you bitch. Five twenty-two dollars. Mr. Spindler, you have to stay on topic. No, no, no. You have to stay on topic. 
And we're not going to take uh, sexually okay, explicit language Okay, I know about nigga. I talk about the ween. We're not going to do that. Stay I, on is topic. It, is it ween? I talk Mr. Blumenblab. I talk ween. So I say to all of you, wave lean on all of the people. And I understand that item 1K, that no nigga live in Nori district. So I ask you to wave lean only there. Thank you, nigga, for okay, letting me talk. Okay, his time's expired. Let's prepare to vote on this item. And Mr. President, for items one, the Department of Building and Safety recommends that one B, D, and J be received and filed as the liens have been paid in full. A, C, E, F, G, I, and K be confirmed. And one H be confirmed at a reduced amount of $1,548.01. Okay, we will do that, but I wanna call up on item one C, uh, Mr. Baker. Item 1C. Yes, sir. Um, Andrew Baker, attorney, appearing for the owner, uh, Anushka DiGiorgio. Uh, simply put, we believe that uh, this, uh, these charges are illegal under Penal Code 688.5, which was enacted on January 1st of this year, which prohibits the city from charging a defendant for the cost of investigation. While this is not technically a criminal case yet, uh, all code enforcement cases that are not uh, compliance, where compliance is not reached, uh, end up as a criminal case. We also believe that the statute of limitations uh, is one year for a penalty. This was incurred uh, late uh, or mid-December 2017. So anything from 2017 to 2018 would be void by operation of law. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, let us prepare to vote. There are no speakers in the queue. Let's prepare to vote on these items. Let's open the roll, close the roll, tabulate the vote. 13 ayes. Can I get uh, general public comment on the screen? Uh, Veronica Duran, uh, Margie Lopez, Lauren Natoli, Natali, please come forward. Umberto Maro. Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, Mr. Wilson. I'm Veronica Duran, homeless advocate. Um, Mr. Wilson, um, I'm still homeless with my baby and I'm in a shelter. I've been doing everything in my power protocol. I've been beat, left for dead. My baby's had to see that. And shelters are not, you know, these crazy men, that's what I have to deal with in shelters with the respect, the way they talk. That's what I have to sleep with my babies next to shelters. They treat you like inmates. You know, some of these people choose to use drugs. Children do not choose to be homeless. I try to, I live in East LA and I'm in a shelter. I try to call Weezar. I try to talk to all these people to help me. And then I, I've been in shelters and then you haven't seen me, Ms. Wilson, because I gave up and I prayed and prayed. I said, okay, Father, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this again. There's no excuse, the funds are there. And the shelter tells me yesterday, oh, well, Mr. Ron, we're gonna have to put you back in the streets because we're running out of funds, which is a lie. Governor Newsom just put 620 million on, on to help homeless, Mr. Thank Wilson. You. I've been even following you to Thank that you. night. Thank you. So if I can have the other speakers come forward, Margie Lopez, Laura, Lauren Natoli, Umberto Moreau, Mark Wilkins, Teresa Flanagan, please identify yourself. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Lauren Natoli from the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Um, LA City has underutilized Measure HHH. Los Angeles residents cast their votes to tell the city that they want homelessness, they want homeless and low income residents to be housed and protected, but LA City does not seem to be listening. It has been three years since Measure HHH was voted upon, and yet not a single supporting ho supportive housing unit has been completed, and all of the money has gone into starting the construction but not finishing it. A bridge home cannot be our city's only effort to protect our vulnerable populations. Where are our city's low-income housing units? Thank you. Next speaker, please come and identify yourself. Yes, sir. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Humberto Moro. Uh, we are in the midst of a house crisis. 
At this time, we uh, offer to keep good jobs, paid jobs for the community. Uh, we are affording or av wanting to keep good jobs at this place. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And we'll be looking for uh, Joanna Aguilera, uh, Sonia Gonzalez, and Hugo Pacheco. Yes, sir. Identify yourself. Mark, uh, Mark Wilkins. Okay, Your Mr. Wilkins. Your Honor, uh, it is important that we keep our community safe and keep our oil industry and um, employment opportunities strong. Uh, we believe that we can meet both goals without sacrificing one for another. Uh, we can drill safely and ensure oil regulations are implemented. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Next speaker, please come forward and identify yourself. Oh, I know you. Good morning. My name is Teresa Flanagan. We work to assist at um, risk youth, veterans, the homeless, and anyone in need of a second chance. Local higher jobs benefits people from Access California across many device, ethnic, and classic backgrounds, including individuals who want to have good paying jobs. Don't estimate these good paying jobs for local residents as well as for potential future workers in the industry such as members of our organization. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good morning, my name is Sonia Gonzalez. Have you ever imagined what it would be like if your boss came to you and you told them that, you, they told you that they were being, you were being replaced by a college intern? Would you feel hurt, confused? I bet one of the questions would be, what did I do to deserve this? You see a 2,500 foot setback on oil and gas will lead to the loss of hundreds and thousands of jobs across California including 100,000 in the, I'm sorry, 100,000 in the LA County area. Um, those jobs would, would appear permanently from the traditional, disappear permanently from the traditional energy industry and go to research students. We know the future of energy involves renewables, but we believe in a smooth transition. Vote no on the 2,500 foot setback. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please identify yourself, please. Good morning. My name is Joanna Aguilera. I'm here to let you know that it is very important that we keep our communities safe and to keep our oil industry implemented, opportunities strong. We believe that we can meet both goals without sacrificing one or the other. We can drill safely and ensure all regulations and implement them, all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, and let's call up Mr. S uh, Spindler. And do we have a Michael uh, Blue or Boo? Michael, come up. Yes, sir, identify yourself. Yes, my name is Hugo Pacheco, and I've come to ask you for a request for action about the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment's management of the LA, LA 32 Neighborhood Council. Tomorrow, August 7, 2019, the LA 32NC will have its regular monthly meeting with board members appointed in direct violation of the bylaws. I know of this because I was the chairperson who produced and got the bylaws passed through the bunk. The Dunn representative is aware of that. He kept trying to stop them from being approved and implemented because he felt they were too restrictive. So now with his silence, we have an, we have, he has approved an illegitimate board. The current treasurer is a staff member of Council Member Weezar's office and we ask why how we could ever get a non-conflict of interest situation where you have a staff member who would probably have to hear the same issues that the community has been discussing. I have much more to say, but I notice that my time is gone and I will sent, submit this in writing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pacheco. So do we have uh, Kayla Guzman? Kayla Guzman. Again, I called for Margie Lopez and Michael. Just come on, miss, and identify yourself. Good morning. Uh, my name is Margie Lopez, and I'm also a homeless advocate. And um, I'm here today to really um, discuss what it's really like in shelters 
and talk about affordable housing. Um, you've all heard about being a paycheck away from being homeless. Um, and the money that's on the table, there's different categories uh, that you help. And I fall into a few categories. Not only am I a senior citizen who's worked since she was 15 and a taxpayer, but I am now a mother of a 14-year-old who's an adopted foster child. So he would be a transitional age youth. And we have been bounced because of a tragedy. We became homeless almost five years ago. And in this current system, we've been bounced in three different shelters. We've lived in different counties. Um, right now, currently, we are in a situation that's safe and probably will be bounced back Thank to you. another shelter. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, next speaker. Mr. Spindler, you want to make your way down here? Yes, identify yourself. Hello, my name is Kayla Guzman. Today I'm here to talk about the jobs the industry provides for the many people of Los Angeles. Offering competing wages, quality health care, continued training, and reliable retirement plans. Don't put those benefits at risk for the families that need it the most. And work hard every day to maintain those opportunities. It is crucial we fight to keep the industry local and keep it safe. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's start Mr. Spindler's clock. Ah, yes. Thank you so much, Honorable Niga, for letting me talk. Today, 1 o'clock, big trouble FBI. Nori, go upstairs at 1 o'clock, and she put herself on Samurai Sword for Price Cooper Waterhouse. Today, Nuri sell out you hub. And now my investor very angry. Very, very mad at Nuri to try to make deal with FBI to not go and raise child behind bars. Now you go upstairs, nigga, you give Price Cooper Waterhouse money. I get 10%, you bastard. I get 10%, and then Mr. Weezer get 5%. Fuck you all. Thank you, Honorable Bodniga, for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank uh, you. That concludes general public comment. What, uh, Madam Clerk, is before this body? Council has motions for posting a referral. They are posted. They are referred. Announcements, members, announcements. Uh, Mr. Buscaino for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. President. As we all know here throughout the city, national night out supporting of our law enforcement partners. And I do want to um, recognize, one, the fact that we take a night out today throughout the city to appreciate, recognize, honor the men and women of the LAPD, um, as well as, for me, Port Police. Uh, day in and day out, they put up their lives in protecting the city. They are our angels in the city of angels. And in my district, I know there's going to be a lot of national light out um, events throughout the city. And I do want to recognize the ones that are taking place tonight in my district. Uh, the first one will be in Southeast Division, kicking off at 3, uh, 330 to 730 in Harbor City on Sepulveda at the coffee, uh, tea, coffee Bean and Tea Leaf on Sepulveda, in Wilmington at the um, Banning's Landing that will begin at 6, and the San Pedro at the New Harvest Church also beginning at 6. So, again, uh, hope you all uh, take time, if you're listening, watching, uh, to uh, pay tribute, spend some time tonight in honor of our men and women in law enforcement here in the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Smith. Thank you. And in Council District 12, we're joining with Mr. Buschiano in our celebration of the LAPD at the Devonshire Division, which will be actually at the Northridge Park next door at the gymnasium in Northridge Park beginning at 6 p.m. All are invited. Thank you. Uh, any other? Uh, Mr. Blumenfield? Yeah, as long as we're, we're talking about uh, National Night Out, come to uh, Reseda Park tonight, also doing National Night Out and showing uh, a film, a free film as well. All right, any other announcements? Let's all rise for adjourning motions.
I am looking to my right. I don't see any adjourning motions to my right. Mr. We Mr. Blumenfield. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I know we've been hearing about all the shootings that have been happening, the Gilroy, El Paso, Dayton, but there was also a shooting, uh, a shooting spree that happened locally here 12 days ago uh, in my district. And I'm asking that we adjourn in the memory of the four victims of that shooting spree that took place on July 25th. Three of the victims were uh, residents of my district. What happened shortly after midnight, a very disturbed 26-year-old man shot and killed his father, Carlos Zaragoza, and his brother, Carlos Pierre Zaragoza. Uh, he then went on, he killed someone in, uh, at a gas station, and then he randomly killed someone on the orange line. Now, all in a short 12-hour time period, uh, he was on a murderous uh, killing and a crime spree until he was finally being able to be taken into custody. Carlos Sr. was 56 years old. He was a longtime employee of the American Carpet Cleaning in Northridge, where he was known as a cheerful and dedicated worker. As one of his coworkers said, he had a positive attitude every morning he came in. He wasn't afraid to take on more jobs, even after he was done with his route, and he rarely took days off. Carlos Sr. met his uh, spouse, Blanca, over 20 years ago. Uh, she was actually shot as well. There were six victims, but she, was, she is uh, in good condition. Uh, both of them were immigrants, Carlos from Mexico, Blanca from El Salvador. The two later moved to Canoga Park to start a family together. Carlos Pierre Zaragoza, the, suspe the suspected gunman's brother, was an enthusiastic person and an active immigrant and workers' right organizer as well as a musician. Some of you may have known him. Uh, he's, his recent activism was done as part of SEIU. In 2014, he was part of a successful campaign to raise the minimum wage for LAUSD workers to $15 an hour. Uh, at the time, the minimum wage was $9 an hour. He also played a crucial role in the 2012 campaign to re renegotiate contractor, contracts for janitors represented by SEIU. He was a musician, and he performed with the Peruvian cumbia band uh, called La Camba. The Zaragozas are survived by their wife and mother, Blanca, and the daughter, sister, Annette. And then there was the woman who was killed at the gas station, and her name was Azuncin Lepe, and she was known by her family as Susie. She was 45 years old. She was shot in North Hollywood at her place of work. She leaves behind four children and a brother. Her brother described her as one of the tremendously sweet person who enjoyed making others laugh and smile. Uh, and then there was Deaton Lamond Harris. No connection, he was randomly shot on the orange line, he was a 55-year-old resident of Reseda. Uh, he, was, he had struggled with addiction himself, but he had recently begun to turn his life around with the support of the Tarzana Treatment Center. Uh, he, had, he was described as having an amazing smile. It was always big. It was always there. His friend Christine Hale remembered him. May they all rest in peace, and we, may we find an end to this gun violence that is plaguing our nation. Thank you, Mr. Blumenfield. Mr. Wizar. Thank you, Mr. President. And colleagues, I ask that we adjourn in the memory of Stefano Giuseppe Riboli, who passed away on July 3rd at the age of 97. Stefano was born in Los Angeles on September 8th, 1921, and lived there until his parents returned to Italy when he was three years old. He was raised in the small mountain village of Berzo San Fermo, just north of Bergamo, Italy. As a young boy in Berzo, Stefano grew up a shepherd as a grew up a shepherd boy herding alpina brown cows in beautiful alpine mountain pastures during the spring and summer months. It was in these mountains that Stefano's passion for all animals blossomed. He was a lover of nature and all things big and small. At the age of 16, Stefano was given the opportunity to live the American dream and was sponsored by his uncle Santo Cambianica to come and work at what was then the very small San Antonio winery that Santo founded in 1917 located in the community of Lincoln Heights, the center of the Italian community. Uncle Santo had no children and mentored and nurtured Stefano like a son. Stefano's deep faith in God, humanity, and kindness toward all people came from the example set by his Uncle Santo. After the Second World War, Stefano met his wife, Madelana, Madelana on her family's farm in Chino, California. It was love at first sight, and they married in 1946, settling down to raise a family a few blocks away from the winery. 
Throughout their 73 years together, they raised three children, all whom work at the winery. They helped raise numerous grandchildren, all who work at the winery, and together have been the driving force behind the winery's success. Their love for each other was beyond words, and they were a great example of teamwork and commitment, always supporting each other's decisions, whether at home or at work. Stefano was an integral part of the success of the San Antonio Winery. His countless hours of hard work, love, and dedication with his lifelong love, Madalena, is the reason for the winery's prosperity today. Throughout their lifetime, they witnessed their small neighborhood winery transform into the 2018 American Winery of the Year by Wine Enthusiast Magazine. Stefano was fondly referred to as Papa Steve. He always welcomed everyone with a smiling face, a glass of wine, and an amazing recollection of names, history, and colorful stories about his early days in Italy and the winery. His unmatched wit, preciseness, generosity, and charm instantly drew everyone to him. His warmth and kindness kept them coming back. For decades, longtime patrons visited the winery just to see him. He loved spending every day at the place he called home, while making it feel home for his loyal customers and his new ones. He always made time for everyone. A dedicated family man, Stefano is survived by his three children, Santo, Kathy, and Steve, who today run the winery. He leaves behind many grandchildren, and he is also survived by his seven great-grandchildren. Stefano left an indelible mark on his family and his community that will never be forgotten. His legacy will live on forever in everyone's hearts and in the soul of the winery and the city he loved. As Stefano would always say, sempre avanti, just keep moving forward no matter what challenges life may bring you. Our deepest condolences to his family and to the San Antonio Winery family, and certainly we have a jewel here in our midst, and oftentimes you hear people don't even know that there's a winery here so close to downtown Los Angeles, but this person is the person that put that winery on the map and made Los Angeles a greater city for all of us. May he rest in peace. Thank you. So I'm continuing to look on my left. Any more adjourning to my left? Any on the right? Okay, members, this meeting is adjourned.